this special edition of Assignment Discovery, explore the wonders of weather. First, see how the sun influences our climate in The Weather Machine. Then learn how coastal cities defend themselves against the destructive powers of a hurricane. Next, ride with storm chasers to find out what it's like in the path of a tornado. And finally, take a look at one of the largest reported hailstones in Things That Fall From The Sky. Now discussion questions for the weather machine. Discuss the nature of seasons. Explain why the northern hemisphere experiences winter while the southern hemisphere experiences summer. Discuss the effect of air pressure on the human body. Why does air pressure have to be regulated in airplanes and submarines? Assignment Discovery now presents The Weather Machine. Every hour of every day, somewhere in the world, it is raining. The hot, humid rainforests at the equator are balanced by the freezing ice caps near the poles. Snow melts from the mountaintops, while the dusty plains suffer from drought. Temperature, air pressure, wind, and moisture are the conditions that create our planet's weather. A sunny morning, a snowy day, or a stormy night. Weather is simply the condition of the air around us. The atmosphere was created approximately four and a half billion years ago, when enormous reservoirs of water and gases erupted from beneath Earth's surface. The atmosphere is our shield that traps the sun's heat to protect us from the deadly cold of space. But it is surprisingly thin. All the world's weather occurs in a thin layer of air just eight miles high called the troposphere. Every extreme is found here, from steaming hot to freezing cold, from powerful winds to torrential rainstorms. Difference in temperature is the weather change we notice most easily. Temperature is simply the measure of cold or hot on a particular scale. Fahrenheit is the common scale for the United States, but all other countries use the Celsius scale. All of our weather is driven by the sun whose center burns at an incredible 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. This sunlight must travel about 93 million miles to reach Earth, but it only takes 8 minutes and 20 seconds to arrive. The sun's heat warms some parts of the Earth more than others. At the North and South Poles, the sun's rays strike at a low angle, Less radiant energy reaches this part of the globe, so there are freezing temperatures all year round. Antarctica is the coldest continent of all. On this freezing tundra is where the lowest temperature on Earth was recorded. In July 1983, Vostok Station, in the middle of the continent, reached a minus 128.6 degrees Fahrenheit. The Earth's temperature depends on its position in relation to the Sun. As the Earth turns on its axis, one hemisphere is tilted toward the Sun and receives direct rays. The other hemisphere is tilted away and receives less sunlight. It is winter. But six months later, this hemisphere is tilted toward the sun and has its summer. Without this simple tilt, our climate would be the same all year round. Almost all of the world's deserts are found 30 degrees north and south of the equator. The Gobi Desert in Asia, the Mojave in North America, and the Great Australian Desert are hot barren regions that receive little rainfall. The Sahara Desert in Africa 
is the largest of the world's deserts, roughly the size of the United States. In September 1922, Alazizia, Libya, reached a scorching 136.4 degrees Fahrenheit, the highest recorded temperature in the world. Temperature not only affects how hot or cold we feel, but it changes the air pressure. That's the force of the atmosphere pushing on the Earth. Warm air weighs less than cool air and creates a low pressure area. Cool air is heavier and creates an area of high pressure. Seen from space, these clouds mark the path of a jet stream, a narrow band of fast moving air about eight miles above the Earth. Jet streams are among the most powerful forces on our planet. The polar jet stream influences weather across the northern hemisphere. Airplanes try to keep out of its path when traveling west. But they do their best to ride with the jet stream to speed their journey east. The jet stream breeds storms beneath it wherever it goes. When it curves north, the jet stream suddenly goes faster and pulls up air from the ocean surface. New air rushes in to replace rising air, and at sea level, this creates huge gusts of wind. This is the start of a region of low pressure, or a surge of warm air. The jet stream is like a river. When it is strong, it flows fast and straight. But when the jet stream is weak, it meanders. This wandering course can cause cold air to sweep down from the Arctic and ridges of warm air to move up from the tropics. The jet stream can create hot weather in Moscow, freezing temperatures in Rome, and warm weather again as far north as Iceland. The jet stream can also create a blocking area of high pressure, a flow of cold air. Wind is the movement of air from a high pressure area to a low pressure area. The rotation of the earth prevents winds from the poles and the equator from blowing directly north or south. Instead, the winds that blow toward the equator curve west. And the winds that blow away from the equator move toward the east. This is called the Coriolis effect, and these winds are called trade winds. Trade winds complete the two giant loops of air that circle the Earth. These enormous loops of air are called Hadley cells, for George Hadley, an 18th century British lawyer who first tried to describe them. A cell is a mass of air that moves together in a circular motion. The North and South Poles each have a cell of their own. Cold air sinks at the poles and then flows north or south where it warms and rises again to complete what is called a polar cell. In the middle of each hemisphere, squeezed between the tropical heat of the Hadley cells and the chilling cold of the polar cells, is the temperate zone. If you look closely, you can see a battle going on in the temperate zone, a clash between warm and cool air. This clash is known as a front. The name has its roots in World War I, when weather information became a classified secret the neutral Norwegians formed their own forecasting service and set up a string of weather stations along the Norwegian coast. They soon discovered that the warm air blowing over the country from the North Atlantic was a single mass that arrived all at once, like a huge army marching forward. 
They called the line where this warm air arrived a front because it resembled the battlefronts of the war in Europe. Today's meteorologists, including those on TV, still plot these military-looking fronts on their weather maps. They are an essential tool in predicting where it will rain. But before there can be rain, there must be moisture. As air flows over the world's oceans, it absorbs water vapor. When the air holds as much moisture as it can, it becomes saturated. The temperature at which the air becomes saturated is called the dew point. If the temperature falls below the dew point, the moisture condenses and falls to the earth as rain, sleet, or snow. These vast interconnected forces are why every day is unique. The freezing icicles in the Arctic are balanced by a steamy rainforest near the equator. These wonders of weather bring diversity to our days, but they also remain a mystery, an ever-changing puzzle that can never quite be solved. Try this activity with your class. Become weather forecasters for a week. Record daily weather patterns such as air pressure, barometer readings, cloud types, wind direction, percentage of cloud cover, and high and low temperatures. Then forecast the weather for your school. Now discussion questions for hurricane. Discuss how a hurricane travels across Africa and moves toward the United States. Where does it get its strength to travel so far? Discuss disaster relief efforts for hurricane victims. Are there volunteer opportunities in your community? Assignment Discovery now presents Hurricane. Homes crushed by giant waves. Boats pulled from their moorings. Trees bowing down, almost begging for mercy. Mother Nature has unleashed a hurricane. On average, two hurricanes strike the United States each year. One-third of all U.S. hurricanes hit Florida. Hurricane comes from the Spanish word huracan, which means big wind. They sometimes spiral toward the Gulf of Mexico from the Atlantic Ocean. In the Pacific, the same storm is called a typhoon, a Chinese word meaning great wind. In the Indian Ocean, this storm is called a tropical cyclone from the Greek word meaning to go around. A hurricane is a tight spiral of clouds. From the sky, it seems like a mystical formation, but its fury is unmistakable. As the North Atlantic Ocean heats up between June and November, otherwise simple storms can begin to transform into raging hurricanes. Hurricanes are born when the ocean surface reaches 80 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. A hurricane is formed within regions of low pressure, created when air heated by the ocean's surface expands and rises. This warm air rises in the shape of a column high into the atmosphere and creates giant thunderclouds. As the column of air rises, it absorbs more heat from the sea surface and its winds start to blow faster. 
As the storm builds, it starts to feel the tug of the trade winds blowing southwestward toward the equator. These prevailing winds start the storm spinning. As the storm grows even larger, it spins faster. Seen from Earth's orbit, this tightly packed storm system reflects sunlight back into space, making it a dazzling white. When the winds reach 74 miles per hour, the storm is strong enough to be called a hurricane. The winds shoot up over the top of the hurricane and fall down through the hole in the center, the eye of the storm. The eye is a column of air between 3 and 40 miles wide. It's so calm that you can see up into the clear blue sky above. Hurricane winds and the action of the eye of the storm produce higher than normal tides and huge ocean waves. This dangerous effect is called the storm surge and it causes 90% of all hurricane deaths. In low-lying coastal regions of Asia, the price in lives lost from these giant storms can reach tremendous proportions. In 1991, an estimated 138,000 people perished in Bangladesh when a 20-foot storm surge flooded the coastal islands. But U.S. hurricanes can be just as violent as their Asian counterparts. In fact, the worst natural disaster in American history was a hurricane. Using the newly invented movie camera, Thomas Edison captured the aftermath of the storm. On September 8, 1900, the sea level town of Galveston, Texas was hit, and by nightfall, half the city was underwater. Wind speeds estimated at over 120 miles per hour sent a 15-foot storm surge rushing through the town. The death toll was 6,000. Galveston learned the hard way, but now it is probably one of the world's best protected cities. Between Galveston and the sea is a 15-foot barrier made to intercept future storm surges. As an extra precaution, many of Galveston's houses are built on stilts high above the ground. On August 17, 1983, Hurricane Alicia tested Galveston's defenses. Though Hurricane Alicia was a more violent storm than the 1900 hurricane, there were only 21 recorded deaths. Officials in the small Central American country of Belize decided to protect against hurricane damage in a different way. In October 1961, the capital, Belize City, was almost totally destroyed by a 10-foot high storm surge from Hurricane Hattie. Afterwards, the capital was moved from the coast to an inland site called Belmopan. Only here, about 50 miles from the ocean, could the capital be safe. In the United States, more than 40 million people live along the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico coastlines. Yet 80% have never experienced a hurricane. The outflow looks very this is why hurricane forecasting is such a tricky business. That's right. If the forecasters give vague warnings, people won't take any notice. But if they press the alarm bells too often, the public may never take them seriously again. But it wasn't so long ago that our knowledge of hurricanes was extremely limited. Before the 1940s, our best information was relayed back from ships caught up in storms. The breakthrough came in 1943. 
a U.S. Air Force plane successfully flew through a hurricane for the first time. New information, such as temperature and wind speeds, could now be analyzed by the meteorologists. And for the first time, they could get a precise fix on the center of the storm. To collect enough data, these dangerous missions sometimes lasted as long as 14 hours. Today, the National Hurricane Center in Coral Gables, Florida, monitors hurricanes over a vast area, stretching from the Caribbean out to Hawaii. The best defense against hurricanes is a good forecast. Good morning. The center of the hurricane has now moved into the Gulf of Mexico. The storm is strengthening at this hour, moving toward the west-northwest at about 10 to 15 miles per hour. We expect it to turn more towards the northwest later today. Therefore, we have issued a hurricane watch this morning to cover the entire Texas and Louisiana coast. Later today, we'll be issuing a hurricane warning. All residents in that area should closely monitor the future progress of this extremely dangerous hurricane. I'm Bob Sheets from the National Hurricane Center in Coral Gables, Florida. Accurate forecasts take skilled analysis and a lot of computer power. Starting to see Meteorologists the use satellites to track the telltale signs of a forming hurricane. When a storm is officially classified as a tropical storm, with winds over 39 miles per hour, it is given a name. Before 1953, only the most severe hurricanes were named. But starting that year, every tropical storm was given a female name. Since 1978, hurricanes have been given both male and female names. Along with tracking hurricanes, the National Hurricane Center measures the intensity of these giant storms. The intensity of the storm can provide advance warning of the damage a hurricane will cause when it hits land. Computers and satellite data have increased our understanding dramatically. These harmless looking clouds off the coast of West Africa could be the beginnings of a hurricane. As the winds move across the Atlantic, they are closely monitored by satellite. Once a hurricane has been confirmed, the scientists use computer models to predict its track and intensity. The eye is becoming well defined. And it's also moving uh, very slowly and to the northwest, so we will have to issue the warnings later today. Absolutely. The traditional model of a hurricane is based on statistical methods. Landfall now, so we'll go up with the hurricane watch here this morning. It's Meteorologists now. forecast the future position by looking at current information about the hurricane, such as its location, and compare it to historical knowledge of similar storms. Computers can combine all the data, wind speed, temperature, air pressure, and humidity, into a model that lets the meteorologists predict the hurricane's behavior. Twenty years ago, we could only track the path of a storm to an accuracy of 200 to 300 miles. Now, a hurricane's course can be pinpointed to within 100 miles. When a hurricane arrives on land, its fury seems unstoppable. If you could harness one day's worth of its energy, it could power the United States for half a year. Even when the winds suddenly stop, the storm is only halfway over. This is the eye of the storm passing over. Clear blue skies above are surrounded by a wall of angry clouds. People often think the eye passing over is the end of the storm. This can be a tragic mistake.
Eventually, the hurricane loses power, and it fades away into just another rainstorm. As it crosses land or hits cool water, it runs out of energy and slowly dies out. In its wake, it leaves a trail of destruction. Meteorologists rank each hurricane on the Saffir-Simpson International Scale of Intensity. The scale ranges from a mild one, indicating 74 to 95 mile per hour winds, to a catastrophic five with 155 mile per hour winds or greater. When Hurricane Andrew devastated Southern Florida in 1992, it was the third strongest storm to strike the United States. It was rated a category four. In 1988, Hurricane Gilbert devastated most of the Caribbean and the Yucatan Peninsula in Central America. This storm rated a five on the Saffir-Simpson scale. It killed 247 people and caused $5 billion worth of damage. Anyone who has survived a hurricane is unlikely to forget the fear and destruction. But with each new storm, meteorologists are more accurate in their life-saving warnings. And they are one step closer to precisely predicting the elusive path of a hurricane. To learn more, members of the American Association of School Librarians and Assignment Discovery suggest The Scariest Place on Earth, Eye to Eye with Hurricanes by David E. Fisher. Ask your librarian to help you explore the many resources your library has to offer. Now, discussion questions for Tornado. Discuss how the destructive forces of a tornado can impact a house. Discuss what to do in a tornado. Make a tornado plan for your house and family. What precautions should you take during a tornado warning? Assignment Discovery now presents Tornado. The sky darkens, thunder booms, and lightning flashes. It seems like just another thunderstorm. But today, it will create the most frightening storm of all. This tornado, captured on home video, swept through McConnell Air Base in Kansas in 1991. The tornado, traveling nearly 70 miles, was on the ground for almost two hours and killed 17 people. This tornado was far from unique. A tornado begins when warm, humid air from the Gulf of Mexico meets cold, dry air channeled down from the Canadian Rockies. The unstable warm air cools as it rises, condensing moisture into huge thunderclouds they produce rain or hail. Thunderstorms draw air up from the ground like a vacuum cleaner. This creates unstable combinations of rising and falling air. The result is a violent rotating storm. This twirling air can form a funnel cloud. If it touches the ground, a tornado is born. A tornado can come in many shapes. From a long, twisted, thin rope to a fat, inverted bell. It may be as narrow as 50 yards or as wide as a few miles. Most are weak, 
but 1% are strong enough to cause significant damage. A tornado can occur anywhere in the world, but they are most common in North America. Over a thousand a year strike here. More than one-third of America's tornadoes strike in Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, a belt known as Tornado Alley. Yeah, go ahead, Chase, too. Between the months of April and July, teams of storm chasers take to the road. Uh, Chase 3, you read me? Their mission is to videotape a tornado. The footage enables storm chasers to test their theories on tornado formation. In 1994, the National Severe Storms Laboratory in Norman, Oklahoma, began the Vortex Project. During this two-year project, scientists hope to unlock the secrets of tornado formation. Vortex leader, Eric Rasmussen, supervises over 75 researchers. They go out on the road with four mobile weather stations, five vehicles loaded with the latest computer systems, and three video teams. Scientists aren't the only people who chase tornadoes. Warren Fadley heads a small elite crew of storm chasers. Hi John, I got some good news He is a you. filmmaker who makes his living right. solely by filming severe weather. Directional speed shear, which you know the veering, uh, will support isolated supercells and, tor and tornadoes in West Texas and portions of the outlook. Today, Warren and his team are heading south out of Amarillo toward Midland, Texas. Chasing tornadoes is a frustrating business. Scientists don't know why one thunderstorm forms a tornado, and others don't. So it's difficult to know which storm to chase. Although they can last for a few hours, most tornadoes are over in a matter of minutes and travel less than three to four miles. Successful chasing depends on luck, intuition, and a vast array of modern equipment. Warren Fadley is armed with the latest technology. One of the most important pieces of equipment we have here is the weather computer. Uh, it allows me to get things like dew points and temperatures and wind speeds. And uh, the nice thing about this is we have this information continuously as we're driving. We don't need to call into a weather service or find out it's here all the time, which is really important. Wind speeds can exceed 300 miles per hour, and the damage they can cause is devastating. It's really hard to imagine the damage that a, that a massive tornado does. You know, I've seen cars that look like they were, they were put through a shredder. Uh, I've seen foundations uh, where houses were they're just completely clean. I mean, nothing, not even a nail left in the, in the concrete. It is really amazing uh, what a tornado can do. The brief visit of a tornado can change lives and communities forever. Once thriving towns are blown away. For the survivors, it's a storm they will never forget. The best defense against a tornado is advance warning. Until recently, tornado warnings came too late and left no time to escape. Now, scientists use the latest generation of radar to pinpoint areas of severe rainfall and high winds. All north of Amarillo initially. But predicting tornadoes is an imprecise science. There wasn't even a whole lot of surface winds involved. They were, they were very, they were really impressive. Each year, the United States can expect from 700 to 1,100 tornadoes. 
Only about 3% of these are powerful enough to kill people. Scientists' goal is to isolate these few killer tornadoes and put a watch out two to six hours ahead. But more urgent warnings may come as close as 10 minutes before the tornado hits. The Vortex team heads north out of Norman toward Emporia, Kansas. Thank you. Let us know when you get to 300. Covering a much wider area, a research plane scans for promising storms. Are you over South Haven? Are you here? Rasmussen sends a probe vehicle further north to take readings. North of Wellington on Highway 81 out of South Haven. The chase area is so vast, he needs some help. So he orders the nearest mobile weather station to send up a weather balloon. As the balloon rises, team member Les Schoel looks for certain conditions. Roger. Humidity at the Earth's surface, a change in wind speed at different heights, and a change in temperature in the atmosphere. If these conditions exist, there is a good chance a tornado will form. But today, the weather balloon readings will indicate that a tornado will not occur. Rasmussen has no choice but to order the team to head for a new storm system 300 miles away. As they reach the new storm area, 